Well, this morning, I've already told you we are in Hebrews chapter 11. What I'd like to do is just read a, um, the first six verses of this chapter to, uh, again, remind us of what it is we're going to be looking at this morning, which is that we must have faith, what that faith actually is, and that without that faith, we cannot please God. And again, since the purpose of this study is to find out how it is we we might please Him. You can see this is very important. So let's begin by reading Hebrews 11, uh, verses 1 through 6. The author to the Hebrews writes this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, (coughs) through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks." By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. May the Lord bless His Word to our hearing this morning. Now again, we've asked the question, what is God looking for in His people? What is it that He is looking for in you? Well, that's what we've been looking at over the past several Lord's Days. And it's really not a difficult thing to figure out if you just simply pick up His Word and read it because He actually fully explains it there. The Lord wants you to have a heart that is devoted to Him completely. He wants you to have a heart that is concerned for those who are around you, as concerned as you are for yourself. He wants you to have a heart that is set on the things that are in heaven and the things that honors God and to obtain actually the honor that God gives and not the honors which the world has to give. And He wants you, as we saw last week, to love His truth and to study His truth, uh, not just so that you can know what it says, but so that you may do what it says. Now, again, we know that, that these are the things that God is looking for. These are the things that are pleasing to Him. But we understand at the same time that this isn't all that He wants to see. There are many other things. And this morning we're going to look at one more. I've already told you what that is. He wants you to have faith. He wants you to believe Him, to trust that what He says in His Word, what He tells you, is actually true. Now, the author to the Hebrews tells us that without faith... Without this kind of faith, it is impossible to please God. He doesn't tell us that it's hard. He doesn't tell us that it's unlikely. But He tells us that it is impossible that we would ever please Him without this particular characteristic. And again, understanding the purpose of this study is to find out what we need to have, what we need to be in order to please God in order to catch His eye, should make us pause and think about this. We need to believe Him. We need to trust His Word. And of course, we need to act upon it. So first, let's consider this morning what the author of the Hebrews actually means by this word faith, because faith can be used in a variety of ways. And secondly, let's try to understand why it is that it's impossible for us to please Him without faith. So first of all, let's consider what the author to the Hebrews actually has in mind by this word, because again, the word can mean several things. It can actually mean at least 
three things, and by the way, I should mention that each of these things is important to God and that we should have them all, as it were, we should understand them all and incorporate them all into our lives. Well, first of all, the word faith can refer to that which we are to believe. In other words, it refers to uh, the content of the gospel. It's called the faith in Scripture. Jude writes this in Jude chapter 1, since there's only one chapter in Jude, verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. The word faith there is referring to the gospel. If you want to please God, you need to know the gospel. You need to know narrowly what it teaches about the way of salvation, how God has sent His Son into the world to save all who trust them, trust in Him from their sins. He will save them from His judgment, and we need to believe it more broadly or understand it more broadly, what the Lord actually calls us to do in the gospel in every area of life. If you don't know this truth, if you don't believe this truth, if you don't contend for this truth, you cannot please God. Okay, so faith, first of all, refers to the content of the gospel. You need to know it. You need to believe it. Now, secondly, the word faith, as you know, is, is perhaps most often used in Scripture, refers to the receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ as He is offered to you in the gospel which means <coughs> actually trusting Jesus to save you, placing your whole hope of entering into heaven on what He has done, His work, His life, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, trusting Him alone to save you from your judgment or from yeah, the judgment that is due to you for your sins. Now, if you don't know what the Lord has done, and if you don't believe that He really did the things that the Bible tells you or that God tells you in His Word that He did, that He really did live on this earth, that He died, rose again, and ascended to heaven, and if you don't trust Him and Him alone to save you, well, then far from pleasing God, you're still His enemy. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to turn from your sins. You have to follow Jesus Christ if you were to please God at all. So if you want to know how to please Him, this is what you have to do. Now again, faith is the content of the gospel. It is the faith. Faith is the believing or receiving Jesus Christ as He is offered in the gospel. Both of these things are very important to pleasing God and, of course, to being safe from His judgment. But this isn't really what the author to the Hebrews has in mind. He's using faith perhaps in a more or in a, in a broader sense. Basically, in the same sense as when we actually trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, only he applies it to everything God says and not just specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ. He wouldn't exclude that. I mean, the whole argument of the book of Hebrews or, the, or the, uh, of the author to the Hebrews in this book is to prove that Jesus is superior to everything in the old covenant and that those who, to whom he's writing need to trust him. He's going to apply this to trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, but he applies it more broadly to everything and how the people of God lived according to what they believed. Now, again, in order to understand that a little bit better, I think it, it's good to, re, to remind ourselves what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to savingly believe in Him. And to do that, you need three things. First of all, you need the faith, the gospel. You need content. You need to know what it is that you are to believe. We call that knowledge. You have to know what the gospel is. That's the first use of the word faith. Secondly, you have to believe that the gospel is true. As I've already said, you're never going to trust Jesus unless you really believe that you're in danger. 
that you really do need a Savior and that Jesus is that Savior, the only Savior, who stands ready to save you if you will only come to Him. You have to believe these things are true. Otherwise, you will never come to Him. But again, thirdly, and this is the part that the author of the Hebrews is going to apply broadly to everything God says, you must actually trust Jesus, okay? You have to act on that belief. You have to receive Him as your Lord and Savior. Just knowing isn't enough. Now, this is something that we've looked at a number of times, and it wouldn't hurt to be reminded again of it this morning. You can have these first two elements of faith. You can know the gospel. You can believe the gospel is true and still not be saved just like the devil who believes that it's true or the demons who also believe it's true and those souls of men and women who are damned in hell. The Bible says that there are those who are suffering right now in hell. They also believe that these things are true and yet they're not saved. You need something more, something that the devil, his demons, and damned souls in hell do not have. You have to act on that belief. You see, if you really believe that you're in danger of God's judgment and you're in danger of hell and you really believe that God will save you if you trust His Son, then you will trust in Him. That is saving faith. At least it is if you have that most needed element, which is what actually allows you to pass from point two, as it were, from just believing to actually trusting, to actually acting on what it is you believe, you need to have something the devil and the demons don't have. You need to have love. Now, the author to the Hebrews doesn't actually say that. He doesn't distinguish that, but this is the kind of faith that he's talking about because this is the only kind of faith that will actually please God. As we read in our meditation, the faith that pleases Him is faith that works through love. That's the only kind that will save you because it's the only kind that will embrace Jesus Christ as He is offered in the gospel. Have you ever known anyone who is an unbeliever, they haven't trusted Jesus Christ, who believe that the Bible is true, who believe that, yes, the Bible says that they're sinners, yes, the Bible says that Jesus is the only Savior, and who believe that if they would only trust in Him that they would be saved, but they still don't trust Him? There are people like that, you know. Uh, the Holy Spirit has a way of awakening people to these truths and showing them that these things are true. But the question rises, if they know that this is true, if they know this is their condition, if they know Jesus is a Savior, if they know that they'll be saved, if they trust Jesus, why don't they trust Him? Well, they don't because they don't want to, because they don't love Him. They don't have this additional element that moves you from the second uh, part of faith to the third, to act on what it is you actually believe. Because the Bible tells us the Spirit of God must be at work in your heart if you are to exercise this kind of faith. The Bible says that He alone is able to put this kind of love in your heart the kind of love that you need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, this is the kind of faith the author to the Hebrews has in mind, a faith that works by love, only in this case he applies it, not just specifically to trusting in Jesus Christ, but rather to believing everything God says in His Word. I mean, Abraham believed God about this land, and he acted on that belief, and he went out looking for that land. Noah believed his warning, and he spent a hundred years of his life building a huge boat on the basis of what God says. So the faith he speaks of here goes beyond just knowing what the Bible says 
And believing that what it says is true, he's talking about the kind of faith that actually embraces God's Word from the heart and sees it not only to be true, but to be welcome. The author defines this faith in verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This kind of faith will assure us that what God says is true. It will give us a full conviction that these things are real, even though we can't see them with our eyes. But it also goes beyond this. Knowing that these things are true, it welcomes and embraces that truth. Now, again, this is the kind of faith you need if you are to please God. You must not only believe that what He says is true, but you must have a heart that is disposed actually to embrace that truth, <clears throat> to actually act upon it, to live according to it. Now, the author to the Hebrews also goes on to give us a couple of reasons why it is impossible to please God if you don't have this kind of faith, he tells us in verse 6. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. He basically gives us two reasons why we cannot please God unless we have this kind of faith. And the first reason is, if you don't have this kind of faith, you're never going to come to God. I want you to notice again that faith is more than just believing that God exists. I've already told you that the Bible tells us that everyone believes that God exists. Now, I know you're going to run into people who are going to say, I don't believe God exists, and we know that there's high-profile atheists that are debating creationists, and they are affirming over and over again, God doesn't exist. All these things came about by chance. Well, you have a choice. You can either believe what they're saying, or you can believe what the Bible says about what they're saying. The Bible says they actually believe that God exists. They know He exists. They're without excuse. Paul tells us in Romans 1, verses 20 and 21, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now listen, for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. By the way, he goes on to say, they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for those things that are corruptible. They began to worship the creation rather than the Creator. And what does the atheist do except exactly that? You realize that atheism is a religion that basically worships the creation or the, the, the things that are as the Creator of them. Now, we realize that atheists don't believe that the creation is necessarily sentient. They don't believe it thinks or it's conscious but they look to it as their origin, as their creator and maker. And how do they know what makes them think this is the way it happened? That's what they choose to believe based upon what they think are processes that explain all of these things. But it really is a faith to believe that it came about this way. So they worship the creation rather than the creator, whereas we worship the creator. Now, again, this shows us something more about this kind of faith because faith isn't just believing the facts. When, well, let's just say faith, faith has to go beyond, first of all, what unbelievers experience. You know, they see it, they believe it, but they suppress it. Uh, we might even say that faith also has something more to do than just believing something that has no evidence. Because Paul here is talking about evidence. He's talking about we see these things through the creation. Faith is not believing against the facts. It's not believing in the absence of the facts. 
It's not believing when everything sort of points against it and you choose to believe it anyway. Actually, that's what atheists do. And it's not believing without any facts at all. It's not as some have described faith as sort of a leap of faith. You know, you, you just sort of leap into the abyss and you hope that something is there to catch you. Some people think that that's what Christians are doing, that they're believing against all the evidence. You're, we're just a bunch of, of, of idiots because we believe what the Bible says or that with no evidence at all, we just sort of leap off the precipice and hope that there's going to be a God there to save us when the end comes and we finally die. No, that's not what faith is. Faith sees the evidence. There is evidence and believes that that evidence is true. But it's more than this, as we've seen. It is seeing the evidence, believing the evidence is true, and welcoming that truth so that you actually come to God. By the way, the evidence I'm referring to is, of course, the creation that tells us that God exists, but also the evidence of His Word and the testimony of the Holy Spirit who bears witness to it. There is plenty of evidence of these truths, and we choose to believe that, you see, by God's grace. That's faith, accepting this evidence, this evidence, this evidence in believing it's true instead of rejecting it as the unbeliever. Both the believer and the unbeliever knows that God exists because of the evidence, but the unbeliever suppresses the knowledge, the things that he sees, while the believer welcomes it. So if you would ever hope to please God, you must not only believe that He is. I mean, if you read uh, Hebrews eleven six, 6, you might think that all you need is what the unbeliever has, you know? I just need to believe that God exists. Well, everyone believes God exists. You need more than that. You need actually to come to Him because you love Him. That is the only thing that's going to be pleasing to God, not knowing that He is and then running away from Him or trying to suppress the fact that He exists the way that atheists do. You have to have this kind of faith if you're going to please God. Otherwise, you will not come to Him. Secondly, if you don't have this kind of faith, you will never seek Him for His rewards. Something else we've seen that is pleasing to God. He who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. Now, I think it goes without saying, if you're not going to come to God, if you're going to refuse to come to God, that's not going to be pleasing to Him. But if you're not going to come to God at all, you're also not going to seek Him for the things that He has promised, for His rewards, for His blessings. And He has promised so many things that we really wouldn't have time to consider them. But let's simply say this that the author to the Hebrews points out many of them in the book, and the Bible is full of the things that God promises to give to those who will seek Him for those blessings. The promise of heaven instead of hell. The promise of a better world to come. The promise of God's help in this life, in all of our difficulties, even deliverance from our enemies. The promise of honor and rewards that God is willing to give in this world and in the next world. God is pleased with those who seek Him for these things. He is pleased with you when you seek these things rather than the things of the world. By the way, we're going to see this evening, and this by way of preview, that's why He was pleased with Moses. Moses gave up everything that the world had to offer. He gave up money, he gave up power, he gave up celebrity status, at least in the eyes of the world. And what did he give all those things up for? For something he couldn't see, something that wasn't present to his eyes, that was wrapped up in a promise that God had given. He chose, instead of the comforts of Egypt, to suffer with God's people for 40 years. And by the way, those 40 years were from 80 to 120. And, you know, he put up with these people, of course, and, and, uh, and he, even in the end, because the people provoked him 
And he did something that was displeasing to God. He wasn't even able to enter into the promised land. But why was he willing to give up the comforts of Egypt to go through all this suffering? It's because he saw something that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. He had a faith that saw the fulfillment of God's promises, believed those things were true, and then he acted upon that belief. He had the kind of faith that pleases God, and that's why he was pleasing to God. Now, if you are to please God, you must have this kind of faith. You must not only have the kind of faith that will move you to come to Him, but also the kind of faith that will move you to seek Him for the honors and for the rewards that He has promised. And so in closing, let me ask you this question. What kind of faith do you have? I mean, we've been looking at faith. We've been looking at the different kinds of faith, the kind that unbelievers have, the kind that believers have, the kind that is pleasing to God. What kind of faith do you have? Do you have just the kind of faith that everybody else has that believes that God exists? Has the Spirit of God worked on your heart to move you beyond that, to believe that what the Bible says is true? Well, if you have that faith, James says that you do well. The demons also believe this and they tremble. Many, if, if not most evangelical churches today would tell you that if you have this kind of faith that believes God exists, believes the Bible is true, then you have everything you need to get to heaven. Just pray the prayer. Just believe these things are true and you're going to end up there. But you know what? The Bible says that's not enough. The demons believe this and they're not saved. And neither will you be saved if your faith doesn't go beyond this, if it doesn't move you to actually embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, if it doesn't actually move you to seek for the reward that He has to give. You need that kind of faith. Now, how can you have this kind of faith if you don't have it? Well, realize the Bible says that you weren't born with this faith. The Bible says that you were actually born in sin, dead in sin. And for that reason, on your own, you would never seek the Lord at all. Jesus says plainly in John chapter 3, He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's not enough to be born into this world. You have to be born a second time. You need that in order to have the kind of faith that is pleasing to God because only the Spirit of God can give that faith. Jesus says in John 3, verses 5 through 8, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus says you have to have two things. To be born of the water is to be born into this world, and that's not enough. I mean, we, we just heard about the birth of a new grandchild. That birth is not enough. That child needs to be born again, and the same thing is true of every single one of us. We need to be born of the water and the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And that birth of the Spirit is the only thing that can give you that missing element that you need to please God that will enable you to embrace what the Word of God actually says and to go the direction God actually calls you to go. That's the only thing that will give you the ability to do this. So what do you do if you know you don't have this kind of faith? If you look at your life and you say, you know what, I believe these things are true, but I'm not really living according to them, well, why not? Because I really don't want to. Well, where do you get the want to? You have to get it from the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, you need to ask God for Him. You need to ask Him for that new birth. You need the saving work of the Holy Spirit and you need to keep asking God until He actually 
grants it. There's a little bit of a catch-22 here because the problem is you really don't want it. If you did, you'd already have it. So you need to ask God for something you don't necessarily want. So you need some kind of motivation to get you to ask Him. So what's going to motivate you? Well, God's given you plenty of motivation in Scripture. If you don't have the Spirit, if you don't have this love, if you don't trust God the way that you need to trust Him, then you will perish in your sins forever in hell. And that is the motivation to get you to seek God for this grace that you might actually trust the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So if you don't have that faith, ask God until He grants it to you. But if you already do have this faith, then thank God for His mercy and continue to do what it is that He calls you to do in Scripture because that's what you will be doing if you have this faith. Seek Him for His reward. Seek Him for His honor. Seek Him for those things that He has promised to give those who actually will seek Him. God is looking for people like that. He's looking for you if you're the one who is seeking Him for His reward, seeking Him for His honor. And the reason is because you are the kind of person that He can use. So seek to be that kind of person. If you have the Spirit of God, remember that the level of faith God is looking for isn't just, as it were, that initial level that He gives to you of trust in Jesus Christ. He wants you to nurture that faith through the means of grace. He wants you to grow in faith, and He wants you to be like these examples we see in Scripture, which this evening we're going to be seeing more of because these are the kind of people that God will use. Well, this evening we're going to look at how that faith impacted their lives, what it moved them to do, and to be reminded again that that is what God wants to see in us. That is what He is going to use. Those are the kinds of people. So if you want to be pleasing to God, seek to be this kind of person through God's grace, through the means of grace. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to uh, take what we've heard and apply it again to us individually.